Good morning, everyone. Uh, my topic for today's presentation is epilepsy and syndromes. And my moderator is Dr. Dhani, sir. This is an overview of all of the topics that we will be going through today. First, we will talk a little about disease versus syndrome. Uh, epilepsy syndromes in neonatal period, epilepsy syndromes in infancy, then in adolescence, then uh, epilepsy syndromes with less specific age uh, relationship, then conditions with epileptic seizures that do not require a diagnosis of epilepsy. And finally, we will, we will talk about special epilepsy conditions. Now, what is a syndrome? A syndrome is a, is a recognizable complex of symptoms and physical findings which indicate a specific condition for which a direct cause is not necessarily understood. And once a causative agent or process is identified with a fairly high degree of certainty, it may be referred to as a disease. Now, this chart, it shows uh, the epilepsy syndromes by age of onset. Um, we will be talking uh, about some of these uh, epileptic syndromes. So first is epilepsy syndromes in neonatal period. In this, our first syndrome will be benign neonatal familial convulsions. Now, although most seizures in the neonatal period are symptomatic of perinatal problems, especially hypoxia and ischemia, idiopathic benign seizures rarely occur in otherwise normal full-term newborns. Now, these cases, they can occur on both a familial and sporadic basis, and it is inherited in an autosomal dominant pattern, and it will typically appear in the first two weeks of life. The most common semiology uh, will be a generalized tonic phase, followed by variable patterns of clonic and autonomic activity. Approximately 10% develop subsequent epilepsy, and, and this disorder has been linked to mutations in two genes, KCNQ2 and KCNQ3, which determine the structure and function of potassium channels and hence influence brain excitability. Next is benign neonatal convulsions. It's also called as fifth day fits, and they will appear in previously normal newborns. The seizure types will include apneic partial or generalized clonic, but not tonic seizures. EEG interictal patterns include normal, focal or multifocal spikes and bursts of theta activity in the central regions, the so-called theta point to alternate. Ictal patterns are mainly rhythmic spikes or rhythmic slow waves. Now, this uh, is an EEG which shows the theta point to alternate pattern in a baby with benign neonatal uh, seizures. The typical picture is cluster of seizures of one to three minutes in duration, which occur for 24 to 48 hours and then cease. During the cluster of convulsive activity, the seizures are said to be resistant to anti-epileptic drugs. <clears throat> and approximately 10% of newborns have ongoing problems, like a few have, uh, are delayed developmentally, they have febrile seizures, or have persistently epileptiform EEGs. Next, we will talk about early myoclonic encephalopathy and Otahara syndrome. Early myoclonic encephalopathy is a rare epileptic syndrome with onset nearly always in the first three months of life, mostly within the neonatal period. The usual and earliest seizure type is fragmentary myoclonus and is regarded as an, as an essential symptom in, uh, in EME. And the closest differential diagnosis for it will be Otahara syndrome in which onset is during the first three months of life, it will present with frequent tonic spasms around 100 to 300 per day. It's often grouped in clusters and rarely focal seizures. Now, this table will show the classic differentiation between Otahara syndrome and early myoclonic epilepsy. In Otahara syndrome, the EEG pattern shows a continuous suppression burst, while in EME, <coughs> it will be a discontinuous <coughs> A discontinuous pattern, suppression burst is not always evident at first, and it is often more distinct during sleep. The primary seizure type in Otahara will be tonic spasms, while in EME it will be myoclonus. Other seizures found in Otahara will be focal motor seizures, hemiconvulsions, and generalized tonic clonic seizures, while in EME uh, they can be focal motor seizures and tonic spasms. 
The major etiology of Ota Hara syndrome is structural lesions, while in EME, they will be uh, the major etiology is metabolic abnormalities. Now, uh, children uh, with Otahara syndrome, around 75% of them will progress to West syndrome and 12% progress to Lennox Gustav syndrome. While in EME, up to 50% develop transient atypical hip syringia with subsequent return to the suppression burst pattern. Now, this is an EEG which shows the typical burst suppression pattern, which can be observed both in Otahara syndrome and uh, early myoclonic encephalopathy. Now, treatment of neonatal seizures, early identification and treatment are crucial in, in managing neonatal seizures to avoid detrimental consequences on neurodevelopment, especially when associated with severe clinical phenotypes. The therapeutic process is further complicated because no specific protocols are available to manage specific epileptic conditions affecting newborns. The underlying etiology of seizures should be the first aspect uh, when treated to consider when treating units, and uh, in particular, in case of drug resistant seizures or recurrent seizures evolving into status epilepticus, corticosteroid therapies have proven to be a valid choice. And in some patients affected by Otahara syndrome, ACTH has, shows, has shown some temporary effect. Usually, the epileptic drugs, the anti epileptic drugs considered in units are phenytoin, phenobarbital, and recently, Levita recitam. Now, uh, epileptic uh, epilepsy syndromes in infancy. First, we will talk about West syndrome. Now, in West syndrome, it includes three features. It includes infantile spasms, developmental arrest, and EEG pattern of hip syndrome. Now, infantile spasms, as a specific type of infantile seizures, it was first identified by Dr. William James West in his own son, way back in 1841. <clears throat> and synonyms for infantile spasms include Blitznik, Salam, Cram, <laughs> Massive Myoclonic Spasms, Lightning Spasms, Flexion Spasms, Jackknife Convulsions, and Infantile Myoclonic Epilepsy. Now, etiology of infantile spasms, about 50% are due to structural causes like perinatal insults, mesencephaly, focal cortical dysplasia, tuberous sclerosis, hemispheric malformations and posterior malformations, and neurocutaneous syndromes. Around 8% are due to chromosomal abnormalities like Down syndrome, Williams syndrome, Miller-Dicker syndrome, and pallister killian syndrome. Metabolic causes may also cause infantile spasms like phenylketonuria, non-ketotic hyperglycemia, methylmalonic uh, acidemia, cobalamin disorders, among others, and single gene disorders include common genes like CDKL5, STXBP1, ARX, among others. Young infants who have spasms without EEG paroxysm have an innocent condition called benign infantile myoclonus that do not require that does not require treatment. Hip arrhythmia is a severe epileptic EEG abnormality. There are mountainous high amplitude asynchronous delta slow waves intermixed with multifocal spikes or poly spikes and wave complexes. Males account for the majority of the patient. This is an EEG which shows the classical hip arrhythmia pattern found in infantile spasms. The onset of infantile spasms occurs before the age of 12 months in 85% of cases and spasms usually cease by age 5 years only to be replaced by other types of seizures. Classically, spasms present with a characteristic flexion jerk or salam attack, and they occur in clusters or series, usually when the child wakes up from sleep. Sometimes, spasms may be asymmetrical and may also have an extension movement rather than the classical flexion jerk, and at times, these spasms may also be very subtle and may even come with unusual repetitive manifestations like yawning, subtle eye movements, chin movements, and pouting.
The prognosis in West syndrome is related to the underlying brain disorder and to the therapy. Patients with idiopathic uh, cryptogenic infantile spasms who receive optimal therapy have the best prognosis, while those with severe encephaloclastic disorders have the worst prognosis. Among all patients with West syndrome, 20% die before reaching the age of five years, and between 75 and 93% have been reported to have learning difficulties. At least 50% have persistent epilepsy, and one half of these individuals develop lennox gustaut syndrome. The treatment and management of infantile spasms and West syndrome should be considered as an urgency. As soon as infantile spasms are suspected, Either from history or home videos, every effort should be made to obtain an EEG within the next 24 to 48 hours, which should record, which should include a sleep recording of at least 20 minutes. Hormonal treatment, which includes oral prednisolone and intramuscular ACTH, is now well-established first-line treatment, with the exception of spasms and tuberous sclerosis, where vegabatrin is the drug of choice. <clears throat> the ketogenic diet and its variants, they are effective treatments available for infantile spasms and should be considered early on if hormonal treatments and vigabatrin fail to achieve complete electroclinical remission. Next, we will talk a little bit about benign partial epilepsy in infancy. It consists of complex partial seizures with normal interictal EEG uh, patterns of awake and asleep. And among those who have developed normally up to the age of two years, 90% continue to develop normally when evaluated at age five. Now, benign myoclonic epilepsy in infancy. This rare condition appears in infancy in normal children, although symptomatic cases have been reported. Features include, include generalized axial, massive myoclonic seizures, interictal EEG pattern of generalized spike waves, and a mixed picture developmentally. Persistent uncontrolled seizures are associated with developmental stagnation and psychomotor retardation. And Dravet syndrome. Dravet syndrome is a rare epileptic encephalopathy of childhood, most frequently associated with mutations in the SCN1A gene. Seizures are typically pharmacoresistant, recurrent, and of multiple types. Patients typically experience developmental delay with profound impairment in neurocognitive functioning, including motor, language, and intellectual deficits. The clinical diagnostic criteria has been divided into three stages. First is seizure onset. In this, the patients, they develop normally until disease onset at age four to eight months in most cases. The first seizure will be typically fever-induced, prolonged and clonic, generalized or unilateral. Patients tend to have normal brain magnetic resonance imaging with limited or no initial EEG abnormalities. In the second stage, which is the worsening stage, between ages one and five years, patients experience multiple other seizure types, including myoclonic, atypical absence and focal seizures. Atonic seizures are unusual and interictal EEG abnormalities may develop in some patients. Next is stabilization phase. Early in this phase, before 10 years, interictal time increases and seizures become shorter in duration, but patients experience a high incidence of multiple seizure types. Cognitive and language impairments become increasingly prominent with progressive worsening of other non-seizure comorbidities, such as developmental delay, crouching gait, and ataxia. Valpovate or clovazam are historical first-line medicines prescribed for Dravet syndrome and are administered in combination as monotherapy is usually unsuccessful. Next is epilepsy syndromes in childhood. First epilepsy syndrome, uh, which we will be talking about, is lennox gustaut syndrome. This is an age-dependent syndrome that includes early childhood onset epilepsy with either mental retardation before seizures start or developmental stagnation leading to retardation that accumulates during the period that epilepsy remains uncontrolled. The syndrome overlaps clinically with other severe myoclonic epileptic syndromes. And approximately 25% of cases of lennox gustaut syndrome, they evolve from infantile spasms uh, or West syndrome, as previously stated. In lennox gustaut syndrome, tonic and atypical absent seizures are the most common seizure types occurring in 71% and 49% of patients, respectively. Uh, generalized tonic-clonic seizures and ecstatic seizures or drop attacks, they occur in approximately one-third of patients, whereas partial seizures occur in about one-quarter. 
the distinctive uh, interdictal EEG pattern is a slow spike wave with frequencies of 2.5 hertz and during sleep bursts of around 10 hertz activity upward. Uh, this is an EEG which shows uh, the typical uh, EEG pattern in lennox gestalt syndrome. Next is benign partial epilepsy of childhood. The syndrome of benign partial epilepsy of childhood is also called as benign romantic epilepsy and benign epilepsy of childhood with centrotemporal spikes. The natural history is favorable for normal neurological and cognitive function plus eventual remission of epilepsy in more than 97%. It is characterized by onset of usually infrequent partial seizures between ages 3 and 13 years, and the temporal distribution of seizure favors nocturnal occurrence, but seizures can occur at any time of the day. The distinctive seizure type is simple partial, often with onset in the face and oral buccal area, variably followed by secondary generalization. The ictus may be sensory or motor or a combination of the two, and ictal phenomena include clonic jerking, speech arrest, drooling and unilateral tonic or clonic convulsions, or merely episodic dysarthry and drooling. In most cases, consciousness is preserved until the seizure secondary uh, generalize, and typically examination is normal, whereas the EEG is demonstrably abnormal, owing to focal spikes that originate most often in the centrotemporal regions. Next is acquired epileptic aphasia or landau Kleffner syndrome, Appearing in early childhood, usually before the age of five years, in previously normal children, the syndrome of acquired epileptic aphasia presents abruptly or subacutely sub with mutism, apparent deafness, uh, behavioral abnormalities, an epileptiform EEG pattern, and seizures in approximately two thirds. However, hearing is normal when evaluated by EBO response audiometry pointing to verbal auditory agnosia as a proper diagnosis instead of deafness. Multiple types of seizures occur, including partial, generalized tonic-clonic, and absent seizures. Typically, the EEG is abnormal owing to generalized or multifocal spike and spike wave patterns. <clears throat> Although clinical investigations, the positron emission tomography, magnetoencephalography, and occasional electroencephalography studies point to temporal lobe dysfunction. In sleep, continuous spikes and waves during slow wave sleep are common, and the seizures tend to be resistant to drug therapy, but they abate with advancing age. Next is childhood epilepsy with occipital paroxysms. Described by Gestalt in 1950, this disorder has prominent occipital epileptiform spike wave activity that appears after eye closure and is suppressed by eye opening. Clinical features include visual symptoms, such as hemianopsias and amorosis, abstract and complex structured visual hallucinations along with seizures, which can be simple and complex partial or generalized convulsions, and prominent postictal symptoms with migraine headaches accompanied by nausea and vomiting. More typically, features may include severe epilepsy, epilepsy confounded by cognitive difficulties, and lesional or symptomatic etiologies that, in some cases, for instance, with, myoto, uh, with mitochondrial encephalopathy, with lactic acidemia and stroke are progressive. These exceptions notwithstanding, uh, usually this, con uh, this condition is uh, characterized with an excellent prognosis. Now we have childhood absence epilepsy of technolepsy. Childhood absence epilepsy, it appears with the onset of absence seizures in early and middle years of childhood. This disorder is characterized by a female predominance and affected individuals are usually of normal intellect and with uh, at least a 40% chance of remission. The absent seizures are quite brief, that, so much so that in some cases, they go unrecognized as seizures for long periods and also tend to occur in clusters. Although absent seizures are the predominant seizure type, other types of seizures occur infrequently, and the classical EEG pattern will be uh, is a monotonous, generalized, three hertz spike wave. And classically, this condition will also overlap with other conditions, especially juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. It is generally felt to uh, be inherited as an autosomal dominant disorder with variable penetrance. Now, uh, epilepsy syndromes in adolescence. 
uh, here we will talk about juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. It is also called as impulsive petit mal or Jan syndrome. It includes the following myoclonic jerks, generalized tonic clonic seizures, and absent seizures. The seizure precipitants include sleep deprivation, stress, alcohol intake, and menses, with sleep deprivation being the most, most common and most important. Interdictal EEG uh, pattern vary from a 3 hertz spike wave to faster patterns of poly spike wave at 4 to 6 hertz. However, EEG patterns may be asymmetrical and misleading. Now, this condition often goes unrecognized or misdiagnosed. The most common source of these errors is the failure to identify the myoclonic jerks that are required for the diagnosis or to misinterpret them as partial seizures. Although the jerks can be disruptive and numerous, occurring repeatedly over a period of minutes to hours, consciousness remains intact. And the typical natural history includes responsiveness to therapy with valproic acid and vulnerability to an exacerbation of seizures when treated with traditional anti-epileptic drugs that modulate uh, use dependent sodium conductance, such as phenytoin and carbamazepine. Now, epilepsy syndromes with less specific age relationship. Here we will talk about Rasmussen encephalitis. This is a progressive disease characterized by drug-resistant focal epilepsy, progressive hemiplegia, and cognitive decline with unihemispheric brain atrophy. This disorder is rare and affects mostly children or young adults. The acute stage is marked by frequent seizures arising from one cerebral hemisphere. And as the disease progresses, different focal seizure semiologies emerge, suggesting newly affected areas of inflammation in one hemisphere. Untreated, these children will develop hemiparesis, hemianopia, and cognitive decline within a year of epilepsy onset. And if the language dominant hemisphere is affected, dysphagia. Finally, there is a relatively stable residual stage with a severe fixed neuro uh, neurological deficit, motor and cognitive problems, and with persisting difficult to treat relapsing epilepsy. Widely varying abnormalities will be seen in EEG, which are often related to the clinical progression and no specific EEG abnormality can distinguish Erasmusen's encephalitis from other causes of focal epilepsy. In this diagram, we can see uh, the uh, MRI brain, which uh, shows progressive right hemisphere atrophy and uh, basal ganglia loss over one year as we go from left to right in a child with Rasmussen's encephalitis. While in B, we will see, uh, we can see a slowly progressive disease with more uh, subtle right hemispheric atrophy uh, in a child with immunosuppressant treatment. Anti-epileptic drugs have a limited effect on seizures and disease progression in Rasmussen's encephalitis. Surgery still remains the only cure for the seizures caused by Rasmussen's encephalitis, but this will have functional consequences because the only effective surgery is uh, remains complete disconnection of the affected hemisphere, hemi-disconnection, either as functional hemispherectomy or hemispherotomy. Now, febrile convulsions, they are the most common epileptic syndrome occurring in more than 3% of the children. Fever from any cause can provoke seizures in susceptible infants and toddlers. Now, these seizures may be partial or generalized, brief or lengthy, single or repeated. Interdictal EGs are normal or have non-specific uh, irregularities and following febrile seizures, the risk of subsequent afebrile seizures is increased from 2 to 7 fold in various studies. Last, we will talk about genetic epilepsy with febrile seizures plus. This is a complex autosomal dominant disorder, usually caused by mutations as SN, uh, SCN1A, which is a voltage-gated sodium channel. About one-third of affected family members only have febrile seizures, although the febrile seizures, they tend to occur, uh, recur well beyond the five to six years of age, even up to teenage years and about one-third develop a few afebrile GTCS in childhood with remission in adolescence, and the remaining one-third may have a variety of generalized epilepsies, including childhood absence and myoclonic aesthetic epilepsy. In addition, some families include patients with focal epilepsy, particularly temporal lobe epilepsy of varying severity. These are my references. Any questions, comments?
as I said, that we need to go through these repeatedly. Yeah. So, cognitively pretty heavy permissions. So, are there any, any doubts? Yes, ma'am. No, I just thought that was sufficient for me. Was sufficient for criteria. The other attributes are attribution, it's not a criteria. There's a burst, then there's an uh, attribution. This is different. These are high frequent rhythms, 16 to 20 seconds, and NRM. So that is a sleep phenomenon. Okay. But bird suppression with the epileptic activity, which is the very, very high amplitude activity, and concentrated for a very brief duration of time. This is the beginning of bird suppression. It might appear, then if you see other sleep changes are a then we should be given a way easily. And I'll be able to amplify the beach car, they could suppress all that. Actually, flat plates on this car. Not there's any more than the plates we need. And birth suppression pattern is a very poor to speak for. Prematurity is needed. So, you can be the two men who premature deliveries of the air, who can cognitive development can be integrated. So we see burst suppression, then very poor. Because the brain is not a give you a Any epilepsy, burst suppression is not. So basically, the uh, take home point would be I would say that you know, in these developing epilepsies, one can convert to another. So Otara can convert to West. West can convert to LGS. Subsequently, it may resolve also later. Or subsequently, may have residual cognitive decline. So these can make specific developmental epilepsy, no specific slots in here. So the page appropriately up to the top. So we, uh, first month of the show would be there. Within a year show would be there. Within five years show. So it is probably following a pattern. That is very good. And obviously, again, for all these weaker, very good friends, related neurology. So best friend in best friends of psychiatry is negative in all your words. So that is very important. Any questions? That is very common pattern. So, EG with the Kanana, B hertz spike in the generalized pattern. But if it is 2.5 hertz spike in the, there are two or three kinds of epilepsy with cognitive decline, then it becomes LGS. We are not so BEX is very important. BEX is very important. They have this very popular oral moments and then. Uh, they sleep off. So this kind of history, then you do an EG, you get this entotic bull spikes. Very good epilepsy. You can resolve all quickly. So you can confidently tell people to some double to lay it and repeat EG, then they do Similar pattern, the patient complains that the periocular movements are, and then the chin vomiting, then penetrocular syndrome. It's a very close relation of it. I was asking to mm -hmm. So again, uh, very good. Similar to those epilepsies, occipital uh, benign epilepsies, so the involvement of occipital. So again, these are good epilepsies. So you can educate them. Sorry, epilepsies are good, so you can educate them. 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 You need to tell them. Good epilepsies, bad epilepsies. Ah. But driver seeing uh, at times it can be very, very difficult. Uh, to know to differentiate karna, uh, can be uh, difficult, but travets is, I think, more earlier on the and it is more, more pronounced in the past to travets. Uh, this is Caesar or fever onset, onset, fever. Ke baad. 
पेशेंट को फेब्राइल सीजन की हिस्ट्री मिलेगी उसके बाद चाइल्ड विल हैव एन नंबर ऑफ एपिलेप्सीज एंड देन सब्सिक्वेंटली विल गो डाउन अब एलजीएस में सब फीवर ऑनसेट एपिलेप्सीज भी है जैसे क्रैवेट्स है ऑनिस्टिपलिक सिंड्रोम दूसरा वो भी है देन देयर आर फ्यू एपिलेप्सीज जस्ट स्लीप एपिलेप्सीज आपको ईजी स्लीप नहीं कराना पड़ेगा या आपको स्लीप ईजी कराना पड़ेगा ये तो नहीं मिलेंगे आपको चेंजेस वन इज एलजीएस एलकेएस देन बेक्स तो ये आपको ये भी पता होना चाहिए पता लगा आपने अभी की चीज कराई उसमें कोई The residents, we have a bent towards epilepsy because it's a it's it's an area you might never have been expertise, but at least you can do justice to few patients. And in the mean, both the these persons learn. So that is why it is important. But never approach these patients blindly. Always have a uh, reasoning with some of your friends to always bank upon them. Ki are we doing right? We need to do something. then that process learning you know patient go fail not every patient can go to detail so